Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming so early. It is my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Sachs. Um, so Andrew completed his undergrad at Princeton University in electrical engineering. Uh, he then went on to Stanford to do his PhD. Um, he was supervised by Jay McClellan, Surya Ganguly, Christoph Schreiner, and Andrew Ng. He subsequently did a postdoc at Harvard, and he is now a postdoctoral researcher at Oxford under Christopher Summerfield and Timothy Behrens. Um, and we were also very fortunate in that Andrew spent about a year hanging around Wits, chatting, doing all kinds of cool research. Uh, so please help me welcome Andrew Sachs. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all the organizers for the opportunity uh, to speak here. So uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is basically generalization error. So how well do um, complex machine learning systems perform on novel data? And of course, that's the measure of any uh, real learning system. But my own motivation is actually not from machine learning. I'm a theoretical neuroscientist. Um, and so for me, the motivation comes from biological neural networks. And it's a remarkable fact that you have hundreds of millions of neurons in your visual cortex, uh, and when you learn some new simple visual association between some new objects, say, and its name, that might engage all of those hundreds of millions of neurons in your visual cortex. Um, and given that, it seems like there's just not enough information in your training labels to specify what all of those neurons ought to be doing. So how could it be that you could learn from few examples uh, without overfitting? And in general, how do we generalize um, despite the massive sizes of the networks uh, involved in our brain? So the goal here really is to understand how performance on novel examples um, evolves over the course of training. And I'll be focusing on neural networks, uh, deep neuro artificial neural networks today. Um, and we'll investigate things like how does generalization depend on initialization, um, how long you train for, the data set statistics, uh, the model complexity, and things like this. Now, if you're familiar with deep learning at all, if you've seen the sort of um, zeitgeist that's growing around deep learning, the message is that bigger is better. So here is one neural network that, at least at the time, was state of the art on a visual object recognition task. And you can see it just has a ton of layers. Each of these boxes is a layer of artificial neurons. They all cascade into each other. It's got this incredibly complex architecture. And um, people just keep making these things deeper and bigger, and they keep working better and better. And in fact, they can have more tunable parameters than the number of training examples, which makes you wonder how on earth are you able to fit that, right? If you have an, um, fewer equations, if you, if you have more unknowns than equations, you wouldn't think you'd be able to fit a model, right? But here, these models seem to work in this regime. And if you go in a little more detail, this is just making this quantitative. Um, on the y-axis here, I'm showing you the generalization accuracy, so the performance on new um, examples in a visual object recognition task. Uh, and on the size of the circle is the size of the neural network that people used on these tasks. And you can see that um, some of these have 155 million parameters, and yet they're still doing pretty well. They're still getting pretty high accuracy. Uh, and the data set that they're trained on only has 1.2 million examples. So you're talking about a model that is way bigger than the size of the data set it's trained on, and yet it's still performing well. OK, so the other thing you probably know about deep networks is that they're very complex, and they're very hard to understand. So what I want to do is bring this down into a much smaller model that you have some hope of getting your, your head around. So let's talk about this simple example. Suppose you're trying to fit a sinusoid. So you just get a one-dimensional input, and you're supposed to produce this red curve as output, so you're trying to fit this sort of red curve here. But I'm only going to give you the 10 points that I've circled here. So you have a small amount of training data. And I'm going to fit this with a neural network. So it, gets, it just has two inputs. It gets a constant value in, and it gets uh, the input x. And then it's supposed to produce its output y hat. Okay, 
And I'm going to have a rectified linear nonlinearity here. So this is a simple nonlinear network. And I'm going to, uh, to keep things even simpler, I'm just going to randomize the first layer weights and then fix them. So uh, I'm only going to be learning the second layer. And then we're going to start the second layer weights at zero and train using batch gradient descent. So this is sort of the simplest vanilla case you could study of how a network might learn this function. And if, you've, if you're familiar with the standard morality tale behind uh, machine learning, you probably heard a story that goes like this. Well, if you have very few hidden neurons, so here I only have two hidden neurons in my network, then the best function it can fit just can't match a sinusoid. It just doesn't have the capacity to match a sinusoid. So it does the best it can, but it sort of gets this solution, which doesn't do very well, right? And then there's sort of the Goldilocks solutions. This now has five hidden neurons where it can just sort of manage to fit the sinusoid, but it doesn't have too many parameters, so things look pretty good. And then if you keep making this model larger, things get catastrophically bad. So now we have 10 neurons, and you can see that it can fit all the training data. That's not the problem. The problem is that we had so many parameters that this system um, uh, overfit like uh, crazy. All right, so this is the standard morality tale, and it trades off between bias, which is saying your model is too simple, it can't possibly fit the function you want, and variance, which is saying the model is too complex, you can't estimate it accurately. It could represent the right function, but you can't estimate it. But you'll notice, if you look in textbooks, they always stop here. So this has, I, I showed you I had 10 input examples, and I stopped when the number of parameters was equal to 10. So what happens if you keep going? And it turns out it works beautifully. So here's a network with 500 neurons, and you can see it just perfectly matches that sinusoid, even though it's still trained with 10 examples. So this is the puzzle that I'd like to understand is why does this work? So it's kind of this interesting picture. Things get sort of better for a time, then they get worse, then they get better again. And if you're systematic about it, as you scan the number of hidden units, you can see there's this huge catastrophic peak in the error right when the number of training examples equals the number of hidden units, which is the number of free parameters here. That's this case. So you get this big spike. But then things get better either way you go, make the model smaller or larger. So um, the fact that these large networks have worked well uh, has struck a lot of people in the field as a big puzzle. Because if you're used to that standard morality tale of um, bias variance trade-off, this seems like it's somehow breaking that trade-off. So there was an influential paper in 2017 that just pointed this out, said, hey, these models really should be too complex and it should be overfitting. And if you use sort of the standard bounds on the estimation error based on things like um, VC dimension, you would predict that these large networks should be really bad. Um, so, uh, I, I just want to throw out there that, in fact, this was a puzzle in the past as well. And if you've ever used a support vector machine, you've used a system that operates in a very different regime. So, support vector machines, um, they generalize well, even sometimes when they correspond to an infinite dimensional feature map. If you've ever used a radial basis function support vector machine, that's an infinite dimensional feature map, but they still generalize well. And the reason why is because they seek out a large margin solution, okay? So they add regularization. You're not just picking any solution that gets zero training error. You're picking the solution that has the largest margin. And that is a key difference. And so what I'd like to show you is that, in fact, basically the same thing is happening when you train these neural networks. And that has to do with the specific way that we've chosen to train them. And the basic idea runs like this. Um, the, norm of a neural network's weights, so just the size of the weights, bounds the complexity of the function it can represent. And that's quite well known. And so if your training procedure tends to favor solutions with smaller weights, then training these massive models is actually OK, because you have this implicit regularization. So the puzzle here really is where does the regularization come from? Because there's nothing that I explicitly told you about where I said I'm trying to find networks with small weights. Right? I just said I just trained the thing, and it seemed to work well. So where does this come from? 
And people have said, oh, maybe it comes from stochastic gradient descent, because there's the stochasticity. That, that might help. But I showed you the case of full batch gradient descent. This is pure gradient descent, so that can't be the um, only contributor. And people have also said, oh, but you could just stop training early. If I don't train for very long, my weights can't move very far, so they can't get very big. That's true, but I've also trained these things for exceptionally long training times, and they still don't overfit. So the puzzle here is where is this regularization actually coming from in the typical training procedure we use for deep networks? Uh, so what I'll talk about today is analyzing this in a tractable case using linear neural networks. I'll talk about shallow networks mostly and then um, a bit about deep networks. Talk about how it transfers to nonlinear neural networks, which is of course what you'd want in practice. And then I'll talk about an application to experience replay, uh, which is a neuroscience uh, application of the, the theories that I'll be developing. All right, so how can we get a handle on this? Well, uh, since we're interested in generalization error, we need a way of calculating generalization error. And if I just give you a data set, like ImageNet or a bunch of spoken words or something like this, then you can estimate the true generalization error, but you can't calculate it, right? You can estimate it by holding out some of your data, training the model on the other, the rest of the data, and then seeing how well it does on this held out bit. But that's still only an estimate of the true generalization error across the distribution of all future examples. So what we need is a model for how data is generated. And the way that I'm going to do that is the student-teacher setup. So basically, I'm going to have one neural network learning from another neural network. We've got this teacher neural network who has its parameters drawn randomly from a Gaussian distribution. And the inputs will also be drawn randomly from a Gaussian distribution. And that means, so I can draw an input. The teacher will give it some value, some label Y and then I can add some noise. So this is gonna be the model underlying how data is generated in this simple scenario. It's just a, basically a linear map plus some noise. And then the student network will also have the same architecture, has these weights W, and it's trying to learn to match the teacher. So this gives us um, some tractability for understanding how these, these models are gonna learn. So within this framework, you can draw a data set of P training examples. So again, those inputs are just drawn from a random Gaussian distribution. And then you run them through the teacher's weights, W bar, and you add noise. And this gives you your data set of your inputs X and your targets Y. So these models have been uh, extensively studied before. There's lots known about them. Um, and here we're sort of gonna be explicitly focusing on a particular regime of interest called the high dimensional regime. So what is the high dimensional setting? Well, in classical statistics, you typically assume that you have way more data than the number of parameters you're trying to estimate. Uh, but we've already seen that these models typically operate in a very different regime. They have an amount of data which is on the order of the number of parameters in the model. So we need a way of capturing this in our model. And we're gonna introduce this very important parameter alpha, which is the ratio of the number of samples to the number of parameters, okay? So in this classical asymptotic limit, alpha would be much greater than one. You'd have lots of training examples compared to the dimensionality of the space. But in the high dimensional regime, if you're in 3D space, you might just have three examples, right? We might even have fewer, you might have two examples. And in general, the high dimensional regime is going to be characterized by both of these quantities, P and N, limiting to infinity, but the ratio is constant. All right. Uh, and the, sort of the final piece, just to sort of illustrate uh, the dynamics that can arise here, is what, what, are, what am I mean by generalization dynamics? Well, here I'm showing sort of the different notions of error that you could measure about this setting. In blue, I'm showing you the error over the training over the course of training on the exact examples that you presented to the student. And you can see it just drops monotonically as it, as it must. Uh, but in orange here, I'm showing you the test error. And again, because I know the model that the, generated the data, I can exactly calculate the test error. So there's no approximation here. 
And you can see that it shows this typical behavior. If you've ever trained a neural network, you've probably seen this. First things get better, and then eventually they get worse over time. Uh, and that's called uh, overtraining. Right, so there's this early stopping test error, which is sort of the best you could do if you'd stop training at the right time. Uh, and then uh, we're interested in the gap between this training and the testing performance, right? Which is the, the question of generalization. All right, so how can we describe these curves? Well, in the shallow case, it's actually fairly straightforward. So when you do gradient descent, this is the dynamics on the weights for a shallow network. This is just standard gradient descent. You could rearrange this to make it look like backpropagation if you wanted to. Um, and we'd like to solve these dynamics to understand how the network evolves over time. And again, this is just linear regression, right? So we know where things are going. We know where things end up. You end up at the least squares solution. So this is just standard linear regression. Um, but what we're interested in is the full path you take to get there. So to access that, um, this is uh, uh, sort of a simple system of linear equations. All you need to do is change basis. So you take your input data and you basically do PCA on it. So you decompose it into its eigen decomposition. And then you analyze the dynamics in that rotated PCA space. And when you do that, everything decouples and you get uh, just these independent equations for each of these uh, rotated Z components. So what this means is that we can express the dynamics of learning in terms of the eigenvalues of this random covariance matrix XX transpose of our data. So if you, if you run PCA on your data, you get back all these eigenvalues. Each one represents the variance in that direction, and that's what's driving the learning. And if you solve that equation, um, this is sort of the picture that emerges. So this is the generalization error over time. It's the sum over all of those different eigenvalues, but each of those terms evolves independently. And the, what's inside the sum has this interesting structure. It basically has two terms. So on the uh, left here, we have a term which basically says, forget your initialization. So you can see it's exponential decay. And this is decreasing to zero over time. It says, forget your initialization and move towards the correct parameters. And then you have this other term, which is overfitting to noise. So this is exponential approach. It's increasing with time. And um, it's bad news, right? You don't, you don't want this term to get too large. So what are some lessons that you can draw from this? Well, first of all, the learning speed for these different modes depends on the eigenvalue. So you can see that the eigenvalue appears in these exponentials. That means that the more variance you have in a direction of your input data, the faster you're learning in that direction. And a second observation I want to make is that the overfitting problem, uh, the eigenvalue shows up in the denominator. So suppose that eigenvalue is really small. Then this term, whoops, then this term is exploding, right? It's getting super big. So that's telling you that overfitting is worse when those eigenvalues are really small. And the final point I'd like to make is if the eigenvalue is exactly zero, what happens? Well, uh, basically you undergo no motion in that direction. So if you think about plugging in zero here, this first exponential term is gonna be equal to one. So you get a constant error, which is how far you are from your initial, from where you start to where you're supposed to go. But at least you don't overfit because there's no dynamics subsequently to that. Yeah. So is that generalization error an expectation? Yeah, that's right. And what is it? Oh, uh, just generalization. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's just my notation. Yeah, so sorry, that, I should, those left and right angle brackets mean an average over new examples I could draw according to this generative, generative model, right? Because that, that's what the generalization error is. It's saying, suppose I have some new input drawn from the same distribution as my training inputs, what do I expect the error to be on that new input? So that's, that's the generalization error. Any other questions? It just stop me whenever. Yeah, so imagine you do PCA on your data set and there are some directions where you just have no data 
There's zero variance. We have nothing in those directions. Um, yeah, yeah. Then gradient descent doesn't move in those directions. It just leaves whatever you put there initially, just stays there. Yeah. Okay. So the picture that's emerging from this is that if you want to understand overfitting, you really need to understand these eigenvalues. Uh, the degree of overfitting depends on the eigenvalues. If you have lots of small eigenvalues, then that's going to be a real problem, and you're going to have lots of overtraining. Whereas if you just have large eigenvalues, you might be okay. You're not going to have substantial overtraining. And those zero eigenvalues are going to contribute a constant error because you're not learning anything in those directions, so you're not getting the right parameters, but at least you're not overtraining. So they're not going to contribute to overtraining either. So we need to understand the typical distribution of these eigenvalues. And to do that, um, we're going to turn to this uh, beautiful result in the high dimensional statistics. And it turns out that this is sort of like a law of large numbers. If you have uh, a large random matrix like we're examining here in this high dimensional regime, it turns out that the eigenvalues converge under fairly generic assumptions to uh, the Marsenko-Pasteur distribution. So you, this is in the same way that it doesn't really matter what the distribution of random variables are. If you sum a lot of them up, you're going to have a Gaussian distribution. That's the um, law of large numbers. This is the same thing, but for large matrices. And it tells you about the distribution of the eigenvalues. It has this interesting structure here. Uh, and so just to be clear what I'm plotting here, I'm plotting the probability, this is a probability density, of seeing different eigenvalues. Um, so you can think of this as a histogram, right? Um, saying, what's the chance that I see an eigenvalue of one? Well, it's, it's this value here, and so on. Uh, and so this distribution has these two elements. First, it has this bulk, which is between these two lines. You see it sort of has this uh, interesting shape. That's called the bulk um, part of the distribution. And then also, it has a spike. So that's a delta function spike. It's actually going off to infinity. And it's exactly at zero. All right. So the marsenko pasteur dis distribution has these two elements. Um, and the spike only appears when you have fewer examples than the dimensionality of your input. So for alpha less than one, you get this spike. Uh, and using the form of this, we can now understand the generalization dynamics in this simple case uh, fairly completely. So let's do that. Um, on the left-hand side here, you can see the case of alpha equals one-half. That means you have half as much data as the number of parameters you're trying to fit. In terms of the Marsenko-Pasteur distribution, that means you have this delta function spike indicating that in half of the, the directions of your input, you just have no data in those directions. And then this bulk sort of has a separation from zero, and then it rises up like this. And that separation is crucial because it means you have no super small eigenvalues. So you're not going to get a lot of overtraining. And indeed, that's what you see. So you can see in these um, curves here, plotting the dynamics, that there's a little bit of overtraining, but it's not catastrophic. And then going all the way over to the other side, this is sort of the classic regime. You have a lot of data, twice as much data as parameters. You can see the spike has disappeared. You still have a nice gap uh, away from zero. And so uh, there's not much overtraining. So the catastrophe really occurs at alpha equals one, when you have exactly as much data as number of uh, uh, directions in your input. And here, the Marsenko-Pasteur distribution snaps up to the origin, and you diverges towards the origins. You have infinitely small eigenvalues, and you have catastrophic overtraining. And you can see that this overtraining just sort of keeps going up. And in fact, if I kept training, it would never stop. It just keeps going up and up and up. All right, so to be a little more systematic about it, here I'm showing you alpha, that's the number of samples divided by the number of parameters on the x-axis, and the generalization performance on the y-axis. And these different colored curves are the amount of training time. And you can see as you continue to train, you get this big spike around alpha equals one, but the things are better either direction you go. Right? So this basically says overtraining is worst at this intermediate amount of data and kind of get better, it gets better either way you go. 
um, which is maybe counterintuitive. All right, so let's just be sure we understand why. There are two things going on here that protect you from overtraining. The first, I'll call a frozen subspace. It's the fact that a fraction one minus alpha of these eigenvalues are exactly equal to zero, corresponding to that spike in the marsenko pasteur distribution. And zero, eigen under zero eigenvalues undergo no dynamics. So they give you a constant error, but, it, but at least you're not overfitting. All right. And the second phenomenon, which is just a property of statistics in high dimensions, is this Eigen gap. If you look at the edge of the bulk that defines the smallest non-zero eigenvalue, it's actually increasing either way you go away from alpha equals one. Right? So this is basically saying you're having better conditioned inputs um, in either direction. And I still, to be Frank, find it hard to get the intuition as to why it's increasing for alpha less than one, but maybe the way to think about it is, suppose I just gave you one example, all right? Well, clearly you'd have just one direction of this, of your input data that matters, and you'd have a fairly large norm, because the input example has a fairly large norm, it's just a normal input example. So that's gonna be a large eigenvalue. And then all the rest are gonna be zero. So that corresponds to this point here, right? You have one large eigenvalue, and all the rest are gonna be zero. Um, and then I guess it sort of trades off as you go up. All right, so even from the simple picture, there are actually still a lot of lessons you can draw about how the training procedures we use are regularizing um, the generalization error. The first thing to talk about is the impact of initial weight size. So remember we have this frozen subspace where gradient descent doesn't move at all. That means whatever you put there initially is stuck there forever. So uh, if you initialize your network with really large weights, that's gonna be bad because you might get a test example which lies in this frozen subspace and it's gonna interact with those really large weights and give you a terrible output. Uh, so this is something that would only happen in the high dimensional regime because if, you're, if you have a, a ton of data, it doesn't matter where you initialize you're gonna overwrite all that because you have enough data to fully fix the model. So that's what I'm showing here. On the left-hand side, um, uh, on the x-axis here is the norm of the initialization I'm drawing for my student. And you can see that the generalization error increases as I increase the norm of the initialization. Um, whereas in the case where you've got lots of data, it's a roughly flat uh, curve here. So that's one message. It's saying that, in fact, Deep networks don't just generically work well. You, you did something important. You initialized them with small weights, which is standard practice. Right? You don't initialize them with giant weights. Uh, and if you hadn't done that, then they might not work so well. A uh, second thing we can look at is early stopping. So uh, you don't have to train forever. You could always choose to stop early. And of course, in practice, you, you can't train forever. So this is more realistic in many ways. So you could ask, how well would you do if you stopped at the right amount of time? And if you recall that the uh, eigenvalues that are small are the ones that cause overtraining, but they're also the ones that learn more slowly, then it would seem to make sense to do early, early stopping, right? Because you're not gonna learn the bad eigenvalues. And indeed, that's, that's the case. So in uh, orange here, I'm showing what happens when you train for a very long time, you get the spike as, as usual. But if you were to early stop at the optimal time, you can see that the spike disappears, all right? So what that means is actually the situation is even a little better than you might have thought. It says, yes, you can overtrain, but even if you do see overtraining, you shouldn't really worry because all you should do is just early stop and then you're basically fine. Um, and the decrease of this curve here is just saying as you get more data, you do better. Right? And that's consistent now. If you do early stopping, you just don't have to worry about this overtraining effect in these simple models. Of course, um, this is a simple model, so whether that transfers to practice always is an open question. All right. Um, so the next thing I'd like to turn to is another subtle effect, which is driving some of these results. Uh, 
And to do this, I'm going to have to talk in a little more detail about these different types of errors. So remember, we have this training error here. Um, we've been talking about the optimal stopping time. We've been talking about overfitting and this training and test gap. But there's another two set, uh, set of two ideas you can introduce. And this is the idea of estimation error and approximation error. So the idea is that I could write the performance of my model um, as the sum of two components. One is how well the best model in my class could possibly do if I were some omniscient oracle that just got to choose the best possible network in my um, model class. That's the approximation error. And then the estimation error, which is the gap between the approximation error and how well I'm actually doing. So that's coming from the error in estimating my parameters, all right? So this green line here, if you remember the model, we have this linear network in the teacher, but then we add noise. The noise that you add, there's nothing you can do to get rid of it. So that's setting the approximation error. Um, the best student network will still be making errors because of the noise that we inject in the teacher. So that's the green line. And then uh, the, any additional error is the estimation error. And if you're familiar with sort of the standard um, pictures in machine learning textbooks, they'll show you a, uh, a, something like this. They'll say, this is how you should think about it. You got this space of hypotheses, which is all of the neural networks you could represent in your network if you change the weights. And then you've got the true function that you're trying to actually implement, all right? And that may not lie in the space of functions you have available to you. So there's this gap between the true function and the best you could possibly do in your hypothesis class. That's the approximation error. And then there's also a gap between h star, which is the, the best you could do if you were omniscient, and h hat, which is what you get when you do the training procedure, and that's the estimation error, right? And so the standard results in um, learning theory will say that the generalization error is less than or equal to essentially an approximation error term plus an estimation error term. Um, so for example, I mean, this is sort of a, a standard version of this. You'd say it's the loss of the best possible hypothesis plus some term which depends on the complexity of your hypothesis space divided by the number of examples you're getting. That, that's, a, that's a sort of standard result. All right, so how can we sort of investigate this idea in this framework? To do this, I'm gonna introduce a feature selection model. So here I have my um, same teacher as before. I've got a bunch of features, a bunch of examples, uh, but I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna say that you're only gonna retain n prime features of those for the student, okay? So you've got this teacher who has lots of inputs, but the student doesn't get to see all those features. It only gets to see the top five here. So all those other features are gonna look like noise, right? There's no way that the student can estimate those. Um, and all, all that that's gonna do basically is look like a teacher that has additional noise in its output. So what we're gonna get is essentially this um, effective noise where all of these parameters have to be changed a little bit to account for the fact that the teacher now has um, unmodelable parts to the input-output map that it's representing. Okay, so um, what happens when you look at, look at this? Well, this is sort of how it maps. So if you used to have um, an approximation error, also called an inverse signal noise ratio of sigma epsilon squared, so this is saying how much noise you're adding to the teacher then as you throw away features, you're gonna have um, even more approximation error, which I'm gonna call phi prime here. Right. And then the load is now gonna be the number of examples divided by n prime, which is the number of features you're retaining, okay? So we can just make this um, change, substitute that back into our original um, expressions for the generalization error that we had and arrive at expressions like this. So this is for linear regression, we're able to explicitly write the um, test error as a sum of these two components. You can see the first term is the approximation error, and the second term is the estimation error. 
All right, so what emerges in this model? Well, here's an example. There's lots of curves here, so let me go through them um, slowly. So on the x-axis, this is how many features we're selecting. And um, there's 40 possible features you could select in this particular example. And uh, in uh, yellow here, we're plotting the test error. So you can see that it sort of increases, but then eventually decreases again. And in red, I'm plotting the approximation error. You can see it's linearly decreasing as I include more features until I can represent everything. And then the estimation error is the gap between those two, and it's this blue, blue curve here. All right. So what can you do with this? Well, a common rule of thumb in machine learning uh, bef before the deep learning revolution is that you should have 10 times as many parameters as the number of examples you have. And if you look at this, you can see that that rule of thumb was designed for a particular regime and it does work in a particular regime. It's over here. Suppose you have a really simple model. And so you're sitting at this particular point where you're only retaining maybe three features. And then someone comes to you and says, you know, it'd be really good if you, you know, you only have three features. It'd be really good if you could actually have 10 times the number of parameters as examples. And what that would do is sort of push you up this um, curve, or sorry, other way around, um, push you down this curve. So if you started with too many features, it would be saying you should decrease the complexity of your model to get a little bit better. And that's indeed um, the case in this regime over here. All right. But it turns out that there's this, um, there's this other point over here, way on the right, where that advice would be completely the wrong advice. Right? What should you do if you're sitting at this point? Well, you could think about making your model smaller, but notice that the test error would go up if you did that. So actually what you want to do is make your model larger. So this might be a little counterintuitive. And um, I call this the realizability advantage, uh, and I'll, I'll try to elucidate why I say that. And the, the intuition to get here is that usually you're encouraged to think of the approximation error and the estimation error as trading off. So you can decrease your approximation error by making your model more complex, but then the cost is going to be a higher estimation error. And that's saying that in this beginning region, the approximation error decreases, but the estimation error increases, all right? But now look at what's happening over on the edge over here. The approximation error decreases, and the estimation error decreases. It just gets better. You're just doing better in every way, okay? Um, and that is what I call the realizability advantage. It's happening in this regime here. And the key thing that's going on is uh, you're able to actually implement the true rule that you wanted once you have a model that's complex enough. Turns out this makes um, uh, learning far, far easier. So this is the distinction in learning theory between non-realizable rules and realizable rules. In our model, this corresponds to is there noise in your teacher or not? If there is noise in your teacher, then you can see that this standard sort of advice works. The estimation error is always increasing and the approximation error is decreasing. But if there's no noise in your teacher, then in fact there's this regime where everything is decreasing. It just all gets better. All right, so uh, why is that? Where does this realizability advantage come from? Um, the intuition is simply this. If I tell you that, that you can implement the exact map you're looking for with zero error, right, there is some neural network which will exactly implement what you're looking for, then any error you see, you know your model's wrong, right? If I had 10 hypotheses and I tell you one of those 10 will get zero errors on any input example you ever see, then any time you see an error, you get to junk the current hypothesis you're thinking about. So this lets you learn really quickly. In the other case, if you're um, not realizable, then when you see an error, when a hypothesis makes an error, you're not sure. See, should I, am I actually doing as well as I could? Maybe I am, 
Maybe this is an error I have to eat. Um, so that's the difference. That's why it's so much faster to learn in the realizable case. And in the, the learning theory version of this is you can see that the bounds for these two cases are quite different. If you're in the agnostic case where you have noise, then you get the square root of the number of examples in the denominator. Whereas if you're realizable, you just get the number of examples in the denominator. That means this is gonna be decreasing much faster, right? So that's the realizability advantage. And if you look at this in the linear case, uh, it's essentially just drawing out this point that uh, the way that it's presented in the textbook might make, you, might make you think that approximation error is independent from its estimation error, but in fact, it is not. So here, the approximation error is phi prime. The estimation error, you can see phi prime shows up again and again um, in the estimation error as well. And so what that means is as you go to the realizable regime, in fact, your estimation error can also be decreasing. Uh, and just to be quantitative about it, here's an example of what the estimation error looks like as a function of the approximation error. You can see it sort of remains high for a while if you have large approximation errors, but then once it gets near zero, it takes this um, steep dive. So your estimation is improving as you approach this realizable regime where you can make um, uh, zero errors. All right, so from this simple shallow linear picture, uh, what is the uh, answer that's emerging for why large models can generalize well? Uh, well, there's three aspects to it. The first bit that I've described is this frozen subspace. So that's basically saying that even though your model's very large, there's a lot of parameters that are undergoing no motion. So they're not really contributing to overtraining, just sort of not playing any role. But you do have to start with small weights to make sure that that's not gonna um, trip you up on new examples. The second phenomenon was this eigengap. It's the fact that in the high dimensional regime, the smallest eigenvalue is well separated from zero um, either way you go away from alpha equals one. So the catastrophe really occurs only when the number of examples is just barely matched to the number of parameters. Uh, when you can just barely squeeze everything in, you're fully sensitive to any noise in your data set. And then the third um, aspect I've talked about is this realizability advantage, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's actually easier to estimate models if you know that the model you're looking for, um, the true model you're looking for, is in your model class. So it's another benefit of having a really large model if you can get into the realizable regime. All right, so that was all with shallow linear networks. Um, the next question we can turn to is how does depth change the picture? Um, and this is really a question about training speed. And we can sort of do the same procedure we've done before, we're gonna have this uh, teacher network over here, and then we're gonna try to learn this mapping now with the deep student. So that means we have multiple layers of tunable weights, but I'm gonna have it be a linear student. So there's no nonlinearity anywhere in here still so that we can get some insight into these learning dynamics. And you're probably thinking, hold on a minute, if there's no nonlinearity in this network, then what's the benefit of adding depth? Because you could have just taken all those weight matrices and multiplied them together. Uh, so here it's important to distinguish uh, a few different concepts. When I say that this is a deep linear network, what I mean is that the map from the input to the output is a linear map. So it's just the product of a bunch of weight matrices. You could always rewrite that as a shallow network because the composition of linear maps is linear. Uh, but then you're gonna take that and you're gonna plug it into a nonlinear error function. This is where nonlinearity comes back in. Uh, so we're gonna take some target that we're supposed to produce and compare it to the target that our network produces and here I'll be using the squared error. Right? So that, that's why this, this model is still nonlinear. And then the learning problem is you're trying to do this minimization. You're trying to minimize um, the error by twiddling all of the weights. And if you look at this, you'll see it's in fact, it's non-convex once you have one or more hidden layers. So it retains this key feature of deep networks, deep nonlinear networks, which is their non-convex optimization problem. So in fact, these simple uh, deep linear networks show a lot of interesting behavior that nonlinear deep networks show. 
Here's, for instance, a five-layer network learning to recognize handwritten digits. And you can see that for the first bunch of time, it is apparently doing nothing at all. And then eventually it starts doing this nonlinear bump down to lower training error. So uh, even these simple linear networks show these complex nonlinear uh, trajectories. And it can also show canonical phenomena from deep learning, like if you first pre-train your networks using unsupervised learning and subsequently train them on your task of interest, that can actually be way faster. So here in the red curve, I'm showing what happens when you do uh, a bunch of pre-training in this period and then you train the network. You see it's so much faster, it's actually worth it to do the pre-training. So the hope is that if we can analyze learning dynamics for the simple case, you can get some insight into these phenomena, even for the nonlinear case. All right. Um, and remarkably, I mean, we're taking basically every assumption we can. It's still hard. It's still hard to solve this. So I'm going to have to add some more assumptions. Uh, and what I'm going to do is observe that most networks are trained from small weights. So I'm not going to seek a general solution. I'm going to seek a reduction of the dynamics that's applicable if you start from small weights. And I won't go through um, the full details here, but here's essentially the idea behind this. So you have, uh, if you were going to do gradient descent in these networks, then you'd get an expression like this. So this is telling you how a weight matrix at layer L should change over time to minimize the error. And you can see that it has these products of weights that show up, so it's definitely nonlinear. There's cubic interactions in the weights. Um, and this is, very, this is a very complicated equation to solve, right? But by the way, when I say gradient descent, sometimes these things can be unclear. When I say gradient descent, that's synonymous to me with backpropagation, uh, which is an algorithm for calculating the gradient direction. There are other ways of doing that, but um, just to say that this is backpropagation, it's just not written the way you've probably usually seen it. Um, but it is doing the exact same thing as backpropagation. Okay, so we'd like to solve this complex equation. What I'm going to do is give you an approximate reduction. So here, if, my, uh, if each layer had n neurons and is a depth D network, there would be n squared times D parameters in this whole network as it evolves. Uh, but this reduction is only going to have n plus 1 parameters. So depth has completely disappeared. And it only the size of the, the number of parameters we need to keep track of is just the input dimensionality. And uh, this is heavily relying on the fact that we're starting from small uh, random weights. And uh, I won't go into it in too much detail, but the main message to take away from this is that, in fact, these equations look like the shallow equations, except for one little tweak which is a scalar that modulates how fast learning proceeds. So here's an example of how this reduction works. On the left here, we have the shallow network, and you can see that it sort of just does exponential approach to its minimum. Uh, when we start looking at the deep reduction, you can see there's this initial plateau, so things slow down near the beginning. And that's really all that depth does in this case, is add this initial plateau behavior. Uh, and in green here, I'm showing you the reduction in uh, orange, I'm showing you a simulation of the full model just so that you can trust that the reduction is accurate. Okay. So what this is, the sort of the message that emerges from this is actually most of what I told you about the shallow network transfers to the deeper network with this one slight modification, which is that things slow down right near the beginning of training when you start with small weights. And using this, you can actually quantify that slowdown. So this is an important question in deep learning. How does training speed scale with depth? Right, suppose I took a network that's five layers deep and then I made it 10 layers deep. Would it train twice as slowly? Would it be exponentially slow in depth? Exactly what is the relationship between depth and training speed? Well, the answer for shallow networks is that the time difference in training a very deep network is the limit as the depth goes to infinity compared to a shallow network is approximately the order of 1 over the initialization scale raised to the power of d. So I haven't exactly told you what b naught is, but it's essentially related to the size of the initialization. You can think of it as just the standard deviation of the initialization. So what that means, this is a, actually quite a powerful prediction. It says if you initialize with very small weights, then you have a small number raised to the power of the depth, so you're exponentially slow with depth. 
this is like catastrophe. It would take a very long time to train. But if you were able to get your initialization to be roughly one, then when you raise one to D, you still get one. And actually, a deep network is only a constant time slower than a shallow network, all right? Uh, and overall, this is saying that deep learning speed is highly sensitive to the size of the initial weights you use. Okay, so I've just told you that when it comes to training speed, small weights are really slow. Large weights train quickly. But if you remember, when I was talking about generalization performance, I told you that you need to use small weights so that the frozen subspace doesn't affect your generalization performance. So it would appear that there's a trade-off. And indeed, that's what this reduction predicts. It says fast training requires large weights, but good generalization requires small weights, and so you sort of have this tunable parameter that will trade off between these um, two things. So if you want to train quickly, you can see you have a higher generalization error, um, and so on. All right, so that's uh, so one of the messages emerging when you add depth into the picture. So to summarize uh, the, the view that's emerging from these linear models, in this high dimensional regime, overtraining is only catastrophic when the data set size is matched to the number of parameters in the model. And you can make a model bigger or smaller to combat that. And the overtraining is not severe um, principally because of this frozen subspace of the weights where at least you're not going to overtrain, um, and this larger eigengap, meaning better condition inputs. And possibly, if you're lucky, this realizability advantage, um, if your model actually is complex enough to implement the exact function you're looking for. But in order to ensure that you're doing well in the high dimensional regime, you have to start with small weights. That is part of the regularization that you're supplying. And I've shown you that that, in certain cases, might trade off uh, with the, the training speed. Okay, so that's the picture emerging from linear models. Now, yes? I, I can repeat, yeah, sure. So, is this all so? And so, all these results, are they based on the teacher student framework where you repeat and randomly sample inputs? And how the structure in data comes away? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So this is all dependent on having random inputs, which of course is not true in an actual data set. Um, and it's, so this is really an, al an analysis of what happens when you have structure linking random inputs to a single output, right? I didn't even allow multiple outputs. So there's different levels of structure. You can have the structure of the correlations in your input, you can also have structure in the input-output correlations. Once you have multiple outputs, you could share information between them. Um, so there is some work analyzing that. The multiple output case, Surya Ganguly has a paper on um, that's related, where they sort of ignore the input correlations entirely and focus on the multiple output case. In this work, I've I have somewhat interesting input correlations. You have this Marsanko-Pasteur distribution, but I only have one output, and we really have to smush them together. That hasn't been done. Um, and then a final comment on that is, if you do unsupervised pre-training with the model that I've talked about here, the inputs are just random Gaussians. There's nothing to learn, right? So all you would do is learn, um, you basically learn to encode every detail of the data, and they're all equally important. So I think to eventually analyze semi-supervised learning, we have to consider more interesting structures in the inputs uh, to analyze that unsupervised pre-training strategy, and we haven't done it yet. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? Yeah. All right, so the question is, uh, what happens when you have non-Gaussian input data? So, um, the Marsenko-Pasteur distribution is fairly robust. So if the input data, if it was just like an exponential distribution, or if it was a minor tweak um, to the 
input feature distribution that it's coming from. That won't change the Marsenko Pasteur distribution, um, provided that all the features are drawn independently. I mean, that's the key assumption, which is what we we're just talking about. So if you break that, then yeah, the picture really changes. And by the way, there's a ton known about it, so I think it's very possible to do this analysis. So for instance, if you start adding correlations, then you'll get eigenvalues that pop out of the bulk that represent that correlation structure. And then as the variance in those um, directions gets smaller and smaller, it'll eventually get absorbed by the bulk, and you can describe how that moves them around. So there, there's a lot known about it. Um, but yeah, here I'm basically assuming you have independently drawn features. The Gaussian assumption is not the key assumption. I think it requires bounded fourth order moments to get the marsenko pester distribution, and then after that you're good. Um, really great presentation so far. I'm loving it. Um, I just wanted to ask about skip connections and if you guys have studied, uh, like what is your definition of depth when you're involving skip connections between layers? and whether the initialization is as important when you're using skip connections, if you've looked at that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. You should do that. Um, <laughs> so the only thing I can tell you is uh, I looked at residual networks briefly. It's not really a skip connection, but it's slightly different architecture. And linear networks with, res with the residual networks, I think there's, there's some other papers that have um, gotten this into publication. Um, and that does speed up learning, is basically identical to setting that B naught parameter equal to one. That is the strategy that the ResNet uses. And in linear networks, I don't think I'll talk about this, but y another way of getting that is just to initialize with orthogonal weights. So if you initialize with orthogonal weights, um, then that's also, that's what B naught equal to one means in this context, actually. So that will also work very well. Um, and that's, just another version of residual nets because if the identity matrix is, of course, an orthogonal matrix. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about um, weights being small enough or early stopping being early enough. But what is the, you know, what's the kind of standard in the problem that you're using to define that? Because numbers just by themselves don't have, are neither large nor small. So, you know, what's the kind of dimensionless unit that you want to compare against? I guess is early stopping 10 epochs, a thousand, a million? Yeah, uh, uh, okay, so I have to think more about that. I can tell you how it scales with the parameters, but um, in terms of knowing an exact, I'm not sure I can say an exact number of epochs. I mean, at a minimum, it will depend on the learning rate. You could always slow down the learning rate and move where that position is. There's another problem for me, which is that I'm analyzing everything in continuous time. So I can make the learning rate a billion, and it will work just fine. It doesn't go unstable. So I think probably to get a concrete answer that would be useful in practice, you'd have to switch to discrete time analysis. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure I have too much to offer. The only thing I will say is you can show that basically the early stopping time increases as the SNR improves, which I think makes sense. If you have higher quality data, um, you can train for longer. So. Yeah, this is sort of these qualitative insights. Um, you had a, when you spoke about deep linear model, deep linear, deep linear um, neural networks, you said that like, so the activations are linear, but then the, um, the essentially, the non-linearity is, in, is introduced by the cost function. Um, why is that not the standard um, with regards to like, because non-linear neural networks, the activations are essentially, the derivative is somewhat similar to the linear, the linear case. It's just like, I'm essentially asking a comparison between the nonlinear deep neural networks and a linear neural network. Right, so um, in terms of a comparison of the dynamics, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, okay. It's a complex question. So there are definitely, basically deep linear networks really are a major simplification. They can't do a lot of stuff. Right. If you train a deep linear network on ImageNet, it's going to do terribly bad. If you, the, the training dynamics I showed you on MNIST, it had the nonlinear bumps down to a better training error, but it was still a terrible training error. Right. So it's not learning a nonlinear input-output map. That's always going to hamstring it because any interesting function you want to learn has to be nonlinear. So it's really a question of what are you interested in. If you're interested in the representational power, the deep linear network has nothing to offer. If you're interested in 
um, learning dynamics, then I think it's useful. Um, and maybe to highlight some other differences, deep linear networks are non-convex, but they're basically the simplest version of that you could imagine. So it turns out that their lost landscape only has global minima. So there's no local minima, which nonlinear networks definitely have, right? So that means that that's a huge simplification. So in the deep linear network, you have saddle points and you have global minima. Um, as long as you don't start at a saddle point or to get really unlucky on an attracting manifold to a saddle point, you're going to converge. So in many ways, it still is a simpler um, situation. Uh, that said, we almost always train our deep networks to zero training error. And that means local minima are not a problem, right? If you hit zero training error, you know you hit the global minimum. So maybe it's not such a bad model. I, I, yeah, I th basically I think it's still open question exactly how good or bad the deep linear network model is. And it sort of depends on the specifics. Um, and maybe two other comments on that is, if you imagine using a rectified linear neural network, then conditioned on which neurons are on, you're back to a linear network, actually. So you could imagine that the dynamics would at least locally describe what's going on in the ReLU network. And another case where the dynamics converge is in, if you look at um, TANH neural networks, they've got this linear region around the origin. So if you start with small weights, you are actually putting them on their linear re region, and then all of this linear dynamics happens until they expel into their nonlinear um, saturating regions. So again, this linear story for those networks at least is sort of a prerequisite or it would describe the beginning part of the training for those networks. Yeah. Cool. Great. Um, all right, so now let's talk about uh, how any of this transfers to nonlinear networks. Um, and as we've just been discussing, nonlinearity is essential, right? So if you're actually going to tackle a real world task, you need it. Um, and so what I'm going to do is basically look through simulation to see whether the qualitative phenomena that I've identified in these shallow networks seems to also hold in simple nonlinear settings. And I'm going to play the same tricks. So I have a teacher network now, I have a student network, but I'm going to add a nonlinearity. So here I'm going to have rectified linear teacher networks. And um, we now have this additional parameter for the student, which is how many hidden neurons should it have? And this is the key question that this nonlinear analysis adds, is just how big do you want this model to be? And in the simulations I'm going to show you, I'm just going to have 15 inputs. I'm going to give you 300 examples. And I'm going to have 30 hidden units in the teacher. Okay, so just you can keep those uh, numbers broadly in mind. And to start with, I'm going to do the simplest version, the simplest extension from the shallow um, linear case. So I'm going to have a random first layer, just draw these randomly and fix them, and then uh, only learn the, the readout weights in the student. All right, so here are some of the results. Let's, let's walk through uh, what happens here. So in red, I'm showing you the training error, if you train for a very long time. You see it decreases and eventually basically hits zero. Uh, and that transition from when it's decreasing to when it hits zero happens at this dotted line, which is basically the alpha equals one point. It's when the number of examples is matched to the number of parameters. You can just barely fit everything into your model. And you can see that at that same point, we've got this big spike in the test error. So at least that property of the overtraining being worst at the uh, intermediate model size definitely seems to be preserved in these nonlinear models. So you can make the situation better by increasing or decreasing uh, the model size. And finally, if you throw early stopping in the mix, that's the blue curve here, you can see that things just get better. And remarkably, they just get better. Uh, it doesn't matter how large the model is. So um, again, this is a model that is 500, and, at the edge here, it's 545 times larger than the teacher, and it's 54 times larger than the number of examples you're giving it, and it's still the best model we tried, right? Another thing we can do in this case, because it's just a simple uh, extension, is we can look at the hidden layer covariance spectrum. So we'd like to understand if anything about those eigenvalues transfers to this setting. 
So because it's nonlinear, uh, we can't get the eigenvalue distribution, although actually I think um, people have now, so it's quite exciting. I think we'll get some new results here soon. Um, so here I'm just looking at it empirically. Uh, and you can see that the empirical distributions do have this marsenko pasteur flavor with at least the same qualitative properties. So over here you have more examples than parameters, and you see that there's basically just a bulk, no spike, uh, eigenvalue well separated from zero, and you don't have catastrophic overtraining. Then on the other end, this is when you have very small amount of data compared to the number of parameters. You can see now there is a spike, but there's still a separation, eigengap around the origin, and you don't have substantial overtraining. And it's only when the number of examples is equal to the number of parameters that you get this catastrophic uh, overtraining phenomenon in this nonlinear case. All right, so that was just training the output layer. What happens if you train the whole thing? That's what you'd usually do, right? Um, and the answer is that uh, qualitatively, most of these trends hold. So this is now training both layers. You can still see that um, you get this peak when the number of parameters equals the number of training examples. Uh, just a side note here, it really is number of parameters. So the thing to count is the number of weights, right? So the position of this line moved around from where it was on the previous slide, where it was the number of hidden units. Here it's um, the number of weights, which um, is, I think, the right way to generalize it. So you get this peak here, but again, the largest model that we tried is the best model uh, in this case. And finally, um, this is all for isotropic inputs, still a very simple model. You might wonder if any of this transfers um, to real world data sets. And here I'm just showing on a MNIST classification task, this is sevens versus nines, that at least again the qualitative properties transfer. So the overtraining peaks when the number of examples is equal to the number of um, parameters and decreases uh, either direction. And a note here, I know that peak might not be might not look huge. That's just because it takes a very long time to train these things. And with my computational resources, I couldn't do it. But good news, other people have gone back later and trained it for way longer and get these beautiful peaks on MNIST and other data sets. So I do think it's a robust effect. And if you want to look at that, um, it's this nice paper by uh, Matthew Weyart. OK. Um, so at least qualitatively, I think some of these ideas are transferring. Another thing that I mentioned uh, was the speed accuracy trade-off. So to look at that, we can look at a three-layer uh, rectified linear network. So we're adding nonlinearity. Now we have multiple layers. Um, and what I'm showing here is different training and test curves as a function of the initial weight scale that I use. And indeed, you'll see that the, so for instance, this brown line here trains the fastest, but it generalizes the worst. And this blue curve here generalizes the best, um, but it trains very slowly and has this long plateau before it initially drops down. So that's sort of consistent with this picture that was emerging. Uh, and if you look at the generalization performance as a function of the initialization scale, then again, you see what we expected. Uh, it's increasing as you uh, increase your initialization. So that's still for gradient descent, still for a simple three-layer a network, you might wonder if it transfers to um, a full case. So here is probably the most complex network we've tried. This is a 10-layer fully connected network trained on CIFAR-10. Um, just two points on it because it's computationally expensive, but indeed we can see that it looks like this trade-off persists even in these nonlinear uh, networks. Although uh, it's not clear if you use modern optimization te techniques like batch norm, that might actually get you around this. So there's more analysis to be done as to whether um, batch norm and other kinds of tricks can, uh, can get you around this. All right. Uh, so to summarize the nonlinear models, um, it does appear that these linear neural network generalization dynamics capture the qualitative behavior in these nonlinear models. And the, the main message emerging from it is that basically right when your training error drops to zero, you were just able to squeeze everything in. And so if there was any noise in your labels, you'd be fully sensitive to it, and that's going to cause maximal overtraining. Um, and large neural networks can generalize very well, provided 
uh, that you initialize them with small weights uh, or do some other kind of regularization. Could be that there are other, other procedures that work uh, even when you're in this high dimensional regime. Okay. Um, and finally, so everything I've told you about so far has been applications to, well, sort of, I guess applications to machine learning, um, certainly hopefully relevant to it. Uh, what I'd like to talk about now is an application to uh, some phenomena in neuroscience. And this is the notion of experience replay. So there's this interesting theory called the complementary learning systems theory. And it's about the interaction and integration of memories in your brain. Your brain has many different regions, many different areas. And there are two that are sort of key to this theory that are involved in, in memory. One of them is called the hippocampus. It's this like seahorse shaped thing here. And the other is the neocortex. And your hippocampus is known to be involved in storing the specifics of experience. So if you damage it or lose it, you won't be able to uh, form specific memories like where you left your keys this morning. Um, but you might retain general knowledge like where you usually find a parking space or something like this. Um, that's the hippocampus is the part that degenerates in Alzheimer's. So um, that's sort of what's thought to be responsible for that uh, loss of episodic memory. So the proposal um, of complementary learning systems is that you initially store experience in your hippocampus and then you replay it out over time into your neocortex where it solidifies into a long-term memory, which is more semantic in character. And, um, you know, when you first hear this, it's like, okay, it could be true, but this seems like a complex strategy, right? Why would you go to the trouble of having this dedicated part of the brain that then has to replay maybe during sleep into other parts of cortex? It's complex. So we'd like to understand why, like, are there normative reasons why you'd sort of be forced into this kind of strategy? Um, so a bit more about experience replay. It is an empirical phenomenon. So if you record from neurons in the hippocampus while an animal is sleeping, then you can see them reactivate in the same temporal order in which they activated during some experience during the day. So a canonical experiment would be you have a mouse running through a maze. It goes left, right, left, right. You find neurons that respond at different points in the maze. And then at nighttime, the mouse is dreaming and you'll see the exact same neurons activate as though it went left, right, left, right again during sleep. It's faster and it goes faster than real time, uh, but it's in the same order. And there are many varieties of this. It turns out if the mouse is running through the maze, you will see it replay in the exact sequence it experienced, but you also see things like, what if I went left here? What if I went right? So it can be perspective replay. And you also see replay that comes back from the goal. So it might, um, there's a piece of cheese, you'll see sort of replay in positions leading up to the cheese. So there are lots of different functions that this could subserve. And I just want to draw out a simple one, which is how might replay impact supervised tasks, right? So this is not the whole space of replay, but just supervised tasks of the sort that we've been studying. And so um, to look at this, we really need one additional piece, which is the dynamics of online learning. So remember, in everything I've been showing you so far, I've been saying you have a batch of data, you're given this batch of data, and you loop through it many times to do your learning process. That's a strategy that's only available to you if you store all the data. So I'm gonna use that as a stand-in model for the hippocampal replay-based strategy. They say you take your batch of data, put it in your hippocampus, and replay it out into cortex during sleep. And then I'm gonna contrast that with a pure online strategy. This would be what you'd have to do if you didn't have a hippocampus. Each time you see an example, you just do a little bit of learning and then you lose the example. You can never visit it again. So that's, that's the online case. Um, the dynamics turn out to be rather simpler um, and you can solve them exactly again. And so here we can now contrast an online strategy versus this batch learning strategy. And um, so on the bottom, this is the same expression I showed you before, where you have this forget initialization, overfit noise kind of um, uh, structure. 
But in the top is what you get out of online learning. And it has an interesting structure that's somewhat reminiscent, but it's a little different. So it also has this forget the initialization term, where you're moving towards the correct parameters and away from your initialization. Um, but now it has a wander near minimum term. So you can think of this as uh, you, you come in towards the true minimum of your function, but you can never quite get there. You always just wander around it because you're seeing random new examples that sort of kick you around nearby. And the size of that wandering is controlled now by the learning rate. Okay, so eta here is the learning rate you use. And you can see that if you use a very small learning rate, then this, you're not going to wander much. Whereas if you lear use a learning rate near two, then this is actually going to diverge. All right. um, and I think the intuition connecting these two is if you have a small learning rate, you're integrating over a ton of experience. Right? If you have a large learning rate, you're not integrating over much experience at all. So that's sort of um, the analogy there. But with these two solutions, we can now directly compare online and batch learning and see how they, how they would do if you used either of these strategies. So what I've done here is plotted the optimal generalization performance for each of these different strategies. That means I've optimized out the learning rate and the training time. So this is basically the best you could possibly do with online learning and the best you could possibly do with batch learning as a function of the amount of data you have uh, for two different levels of signal to noise. And what you can see here is over on the left, the batch learning, it's a little better than the online learning, but it's really not a huge win. Right? It doesn't buy you that much. And this is for a case where there's a lot of noise in your data set. And the intuition is, if there's noise in your data set, there's nothing you can do about it. You just need to see more data so that you can average out the noise. Whereas in this batch learning case, uh, you can see that there's a regime where, I'm sorry, with this high SNR case, where you have little noise in your data, you can see there's this regime where things work really, really well for batch learning. And this is decisively better. And it's precisely this regime where you have a small amount of data uh, and your labels are extremely accurate. So um, I think this perspective adds some interesting ideas to this uh, concept of experience replay. It adds the idea that too much replay could, in fact, be a bad thing. You could start overtraining. So you, the brain needs to somehow modulate how much replay it does. Um, and it adds this idea that replay is only really decisively beneficial when the training data is scarce and the task labels are accurate. But I would argue that's actually exactly the case that we usually face, right? So if you think about human learning, you usually get very few examples. But it's very rare that your caregiver would say, that's a, that's a goose when it's really a dog, right? So the labels you get are quite good. Um, and in that regime, this dual system memory uh, can be normatively desirable. OK. Um, so to clude, conclude this broad first section of the talk on generalization, um, I've told you that large neural networks can avoid overfitting provided that you use low uh, norm initializations. And that's really arising just from the dynamics of gradient descent in combination with properties of the high dimensional regime. Um, overtraining is dangerous when the model is able to just fit in the data. And at least in deep networks, some deep networks, there's this tension between training speed and generalization performance. And I think that this will give us some uh, additional interesting ideas when we put it in contact with um, phenomena like experience replay. So um, if you're interested in these ideas, uh, here are some references you can go look at. Most of the work that I've described is in this first paper here, um, but there are uh, a bunch of others. And maybe I'll stop here in case you have any questions before going on to sort of a different topic. Yeah. Hi, um, you just said that the optimal length of the replay depends on the task signal to noise ratio. Is that something that, that can be um, experimentally tested in animals um, or humans, I guess, in terms of the amount of replay and the experiment that you're giving it, how much noise there is in the experiment? Uh, yes, I, I hope so. Um, I'm currently collaborating with uh, team at Genalia, which is a research, neuroscience research institution, we're trying to do that. So I don't know if it will work, but it will certainly be interesting to try, yeah.
So everything I was just talk talking about was about generalization dynamics. Let's switch to looking at training error. And let's focus in on depth. So um, to my mind, deep learning is interesting because it works really well in machine learning. But it's also interesting because it's a problem that the brain almost certainly has to face. Because the brain does have layered structure. And it has this as a matter of anatomy, also as a matter of physiology. Um, and so, for instance, if you were to look at your visual cortex, uh, you'd have signals coming in from your retina, goes through subcortical structures, and when it gets to cortex, it goes through this series of brain areas, V1, V2, V4, and so on. And that's part of your object recognition pathway, right? So there's maybe, it's, don't know how to count exactly, but there's maybe approximately five serial stages of computation in your visual cortex. And of course, if you were to zoom in on any of these areas, there's interlaminar structure. So signals um, go through several layers, even within one brain area. Again, it's no way to give an exact count of how many layers of signal propagation there are, but maybe there's something like two to three layers. And so what that means is overall, there's something like 10 to 20 layers of um, signal propagation in your visual cortex. And we know from the computational sciences that depth complicates learning, right? So if uh, you train one of these networks on a, a digit recognition task, then as I mentioned before, you can see a much more sort of nonlinear uh, decrease in error over time. So I think to the extent that you believe that the brain has this structure and to the extent that you agree that deep learning is hard, then we should be wondering how Deep learning is impacting learning in the brain, right? Um, and so what I'll talk about in the second half is a theory of deep linear learning, but it's really a theory of training error in deep linear learning, uh, and then an application to human semantic development as another uh, concrete psychological application this time. And again, the workhorse model that I'm gonna use is this deep linear network. So here we have a nonlinear neural network, the key difference from what I've been looking at before is I'm gonna let this output layer have multiple units. Uh, and usually in a nonlinear network, you have all these nonlinear functions f, but I'm going to just um, strike them out. So that's, again, the deep linear network. That's all we're studying here. And uh, this is really about getting a model that's simple enough that you can have a clear, um, clear predictions that come from it, right? So for the brain sciences, you really need to know the prediction you're making is robust. So suppose you train an ImageNet model and you find some interesting phenomenon. Someone could come back to you and say, okay, yeah, but if you'd used 10H neurons or if you'd made the hidden layer three neurons larger or if you'd changed the data set in this way, you wouldn't have gotten the same thing. So the goal here is to find out what phenomena can you attribute specifically to depth um, that you could really hang your hat on for an empirical prediction. All right, and as I've talked about before, um, this model is completely controlling for rep representational power because it's always just implementing a linear map and it really only has depth in it. So that's uh, useful, I think, for the brain sciences. It's a way of isolating the impact of depth. Okay, um, so I've talked about those points, so um, when it comes to gradient descent in this model, now we're back to this hairy equation that I displayed er earlier. This is what it looks like. Uh, we have cubic interactions. And now, instead of having a teacher network, I'm gonna suppose that we're just given a data set. And what will matter to learning dynamics for this linear case turns out to just be the input-output correlations and the input correlations. All right, so these are sort of what we need to know about the statistics of the world in order to understand the learning dynamics. Uh, and what we like to do is, as a function of the structure in the world, understand um, how things unfold. All right, so there's been a lot of work uh, on these deep linear networks. Most, the biggest difference with what I'm gonna be showing you is that um, most of these analyses have applied to sort of single hidden layer or shallow networks, so this is really adding deeper structures. And 
the way that uh, I'm going to go about this is in the original equations, everything is coupled together. So if you think about changing a weight, I mean, this is the essential problem of deep learning, right? Imagine changing this weight. It's going to change the activation of this neuron a little bit, but that's going to have these, it's going to flow through all of these connections. So it's going to have complex consequences for all of these neurons and then all of these neurons and so on. And so there's massive coupling across the network. And it's that coupling that makes it hard to understand what's going on. Well, it turns out that in the linear case, you can do a particular change of variables that just separates all of the coupling out. And it's based on the singular value decomposition. I'll talk about it in a bit more detail later. And this is also, there are some other technical assumptions that make this work. But at the end of the day, when you've done this transformation, you've taken this network where everything is coupled, and you've actually turned it into just a bunch of one-dimensional chains. You really can think of this as uh, just a string of single neurons with weights between them. And uh, you don't need to know what one chain is doing to tell the dynamics of another chain. So there's no coupling. All right, so how does this sort of, uh, how does this look? How does this work? Well, um, in the top row here, I'm showing you the statistics that the world is providing for a little data set that I made up. It has a bird, a fish, a tree, and a flower that have some different properties, like they can grow, move, fly, et cetera. And you'll notice that it has this hierarchical structure. So there's sort of the animals and the plants, right? And then there's a lower level of the bird and the fish, tree and flower. So I can take that input-output correlation matrix, and I can decompose it using the singular value decomposition, which decomposes it into the product of three matrices. And those matrices have these different modes. And a mode links together a set of features with a set of items. So this first mode is saying, OK, what is common to all of the items in this data set? Well, they can all grow. And then to a lesser degree, they have these other properties. The second mode is distinguishing the birds, uh, sorry, the animals from the plants. And it's saying that the key features that that distinguishes is whether they can move or whether they have roots and so on down the hierarchy. So the, you can see that at least for this example, the modes correspond to the structure in the data set. And then the final piece is these singular values which determine the strength of that association in the data set. And so what we're doing in this change of variables is we're analyzing things in the reference frame of the SVD where the network is going to essentially have effective singular values. So these will start off at zero and then they rise up over time to take the value that they're supposed to take in the um, uh, true world. So here's a little movie that demonstrates it. So you can see that they start off at zero on the diagonal there and then they fill in over time, and as they do, the input-output map of this network refines to represent the true structure that was in your training data set. All right. Um, so when you do this, and you're back to this one-dimensional chain, you can actually get explicit expressions for how those effective singular values are going to change over time. And it depends on depth. I won't go through the details of these equations, but I'll just show you what they, what they look like. So in a shallow network, the effective singular values just undergo exponential approach. You can see they just kind of rise asymptotically to their final value. But in a deep network, things suddenly change, and you get these sigmoidal shapes to the curves. So this means that you basically knew nothing about this particular aspect of your training environment, and then all of a sudden, in a brief period of time, you transition to basically mastering that particular uh, aspect of it. And in very deep networks, it's, Similar story, maybe the um, initial period is longer and then you have uh, a similar sigmoidal trajectory. Okay, so this is saying that there's this key qualitative difference between the dynamics in these two networks. In a shallow network, um, you're gonna have exponential approach for all of the singular, um, effective singular values over time. Whereas in the deep network, you're gonna have these sigmoidal sh shapes. And here in blue, I'm showing you the solutions that we um, derived. And in red, I'm showing you simulations of the full dynamics starting from random weights. So you can see that they give a good uh, description. All right. Um, and once you have these solutions, of course, you basically ask any question you want. So again, this now we just have an explicit formula for all of the weights in this network over the entire course of training, right? So one question you can ask is, 
uh, what is the time scale of learning? And here the result's quite sim simple. It just says that the time scale is one over the singular value in the environment. So that is just a formalization of the notion that the stronger the statistical association in your input output map, the, the faster you learn it. All right. Um, so from analyzing this model, we've seen that depth itself, apart from neural nonlinearities, strongly impacts learning dynamics and creates these sigmoidal learning trajectories. And there was a time when people thought that that really depended on nonlinearity. The notion was you've got these sigmoidal neurons. When some of them saturate, when they're in their saturation regime, the derivative back through them is zero. And so that is what causes these long plateaus in learning. Turns out it's not always the case. Right? It can be just from near depth, uh, and it doesn't rely on the nonlinearity. Uh, yeah, and then one result that emerges from this is that the learning speed is ordered by the singular value strength strongly. So you get these waves of um, singular values popping up one after the other. Okay, so what can you do with this in terms of understanding um, phenomena in uh, neuroscience and psychology? So I'm going to turn finally to the question of human semantic development. So this really is the question of um, what is the human concept of, what are human concepts actually, is basically the question behind uh, semantic cognition. But what does a human mean when they say that this is a dog? And of course, if you show this to a convolutional network, right, if you show this to an image net deep learning network, it would say, no problem, that's class 251, right? Um, and that is, of course, so far from our concept of what a dog is. But I don't want to make light of it. So if you look at the different dogs here at the pixel level, they basically share nothing in common at the pixel level. So it is quite impressive, actually, that the deep network can extract that invariant structure. But still, if you ask a human, um, they would know all kinds of interesting facts about dogs. They'd be able to say it has fur. They'd be able to say it can run. Um, it likes meat. I mean, that's something about a dog's theory of mind, right? That's like the dog as an agent. What goals does it pursue? Um, it chases frisbees. And you could even attest to things that you've probably, hopefully, never experienced yourself, like that a dog has a spleen, right? You've never seen that yourself, but you probably think it's true. And um, in fact, it, you couldn't really say what a human means by uh, a dog without putting it in relation to all the other knowledge you know. So you would be able to say things like, a dog is an animal, it's kind of like a wolf, and it's nothing like seaweed. And um, in general, our world does seem to have this sort of rich, nested hierarchical structure of categories within categories. And uh, the question is, how do we acquire this kind of knowledge um, over development? Of course, you're not born with it, so you do seem to learn it. And um, this has been intensely studied empirically by developmental psychologists. And I won't go through all of these, but I just want to pick out some of the phenomena so you get a sense of uh, the kind of things that they're studying. So um, one here at the top is progressive differentiation. So this is the idea that children tend to learn very broad distinctions, such as between animals and plants, before they learn finer distinctions between like Rottweiler and miniature Schnauzer. Um, another uh, aspect that I'll talk about later is this idea of illusory correlations. So children will also attest to beliefs that they could never have directly observed. Something like, a worm has bones. And, uh, children will say, yes, a worm does have bones. They couldn't possibly have observed that. So where did that belief come from uh, in their mind? And there are many other phenomena. So this question um, has long been a focus for modelers. There have been attempts to sort of fit things explicitly into a hierarchy, um, and prove to be quite brittle. And then there was this influential approach based on structured graphical models that said maybe what you do is infer a graph structure to fit all of your items um, into knowledge of the world. That's sort of a probabilistic version of, of this hierarchical approach. Uh, and, but what I'd like to focus on is a, something coming from the neural network tradition. So this goes back to David Rummelhart, co-discoverer of backpropagation. 
um, and more recent work with Tim Rogers and Jay McClelland. And they said, well, maybe this is how it works. Maybe you just see items and you see the properties that they have and you learn with some more generic neural network to learn this association between um, these properties and items. So for instance, this network would be looking at a canary and um, it has this relation layer which says sort of the type of feature you're looking for. In this case, it's can. And so this is, network is saying that a canary can grow, move, fly, and sing. And um, I mean, there are different ways of thinking about this. I would say you can imagine this input layer to sort of be the output layer of a standard convolutional network, right? So this is really about what comes after. You've identified the perceptual item, but you're trying to learn its semantic properties. That's sort of what this network is modeling. So here we have simple inputs and rich outputs, whereas usually you might think of a network as having complex inputs and simple outputs. All right. Um, so. We'd li I'd like to do a version of this approach, but really understand how structure in the world comes to be embedded in these neural networks, right? And to do this, I'm going to uh, take the following approach. So I'm gonna just posit that the real world is a structured generative model. And then I'm gonna draw a bunch of data from it. And then I'm gonna pass it to my deep linear network, okay? And uh, of course, the key thing here is we have an analytic link between uh, the learning dynamics and the singular value decomposition of the correlation structure. So what that means is in the limit of many features, if you can just calculate the SVD for the different graph graphical models, you'll immediately know how the learning dynamics will proceed. And so here are some uh, examples of this. On, along the top, I'm showing the structure that's actually out there in the world. And then I'm showing the resulting um, item covariance matrix, which is sort of the statistical structure in the data set. And then the singular vectors, so how the neural network will break it down. And then finally, I'm showing an MDS scaling. So this is sort of a, uh, embedding the hidden representations of the network over the course of learning. Um, and so for instance, this cluster example gives this block diagonal structure. And you can see that the first three singular vectors clearly pick out the three different clusters. And then if you look at what happens over learning, everything starts jumbled together at the beginning, but they rapidly separate out into three different clusters. If you look at this tree example, you have ultrametric structure in your covariance matrix. That's diagonalized by Haar wavelets. So these basically respect the structure of this tree. You can see the first one is what's common to everything. The next one is splits off the, or sort of the top level distinction and so on down the hierarchy. So at the level of learning dynamics, you again see sort of the tree structure unfold over the course of learning. Um, chains yield Fourier modes is their um, representation. And finally, just a note that um, I'm using these structured models of the world as approximations. The real world doesn't conform to any one structure, right? So um, this was one problem with the original proposals from the structured graphical models is they would just try to fit a tree and then they try to fit a ring. And what if the real world is somewhere in between? They couldn't really deal with that. But the neural network will always just do the SVD. So here's an example where you have a tree structure, but then you also have some cross-cutting cross dimension. It might be whether an animal is a predator or prey, or whether it's equatorial or um, arctic. And still, it will sort of represent something about the tree structure, but then it will very happily also have a singular vector that cuts across um, the tree structure to represent that additional information. Okay, so um, what can we do with this? Well, I mentioned this phenomenon of progressive differentiation where you would tend to learn broader distinctions before lower distinctions. Um, and we'd like to see if some version of this arises in these deep networks. And in fact, um, it's fairly straightforward to show that they do. So remember that I've told you that in these networks, uh, the singular vectors mirror the hierarchy structure for this hierarchical data set. Um, that's just uh, a consequence of this correlation structure being ultrametric. And the singular values 
for a broad range of hierarchies decay with depth, okay? So if you look at the singular values, they're decaying with the depth of the distinction. And uh, from the learning dynamics, we know that that means that the learning speed will also be ordered by uh, depth. And we get these stage-like transitions. So this is going to exhibit uh, progressive differentiation. So here's an example. On the left, I'm showing you the um, different modes of this data set popping up according to their sigmoidal trajectories. And on the right, you're seeing the unfolding um, embedding of these items in the hidden layer of this neural network. And you can see that it mirrors the tree structure. So it slowly splits these things apart, um, uh, progressively getting the finer and finer distinctions. So um, this phenomenon was motivated, in fact, by observing this in a nonlinear network. So you might be wondering, okay, happens in a linear network, does it happen in a nonlinear network? Well, on the left here, I'm showing you um, a nonlinear network, that uh, Rummelhart network that I showed you earlier, and you can see that its MDS scaling, it's not as clean as in the linear case, but indeed it splits the animals from the plants first, and then sort of the finer level distinctions between birds and fish, and then the eventual fine level distinctions. And um, this is in one of those examples where it wasn't actually about nonlinearity, this particular phenomenon. This particular phenomenon was just about depth, and you can recover most of the behavior from this deep linear network. All right. Um, and uh, one final empirical uh, aspect I'll talk about, I brought up this notion of illusory correlations. This is a very famous example um, from the developmental psychologist Sue Carey, who said, look, children say they attest to beliefs they could never have seen. So there's no way that children can be using some simple association of inputs to the properties they have. And she's right about that, but I would say she's describing shallow networks. Actually, once you add depth into the picture, they're not so simple. And deep networks can indeed show these illusory correlations. So here I'm plotting in blue the prediction of the network for a particular feature, like has bones maybe. And you can see that it first increases before eventually decreasing to its correct value. So if you were to ask the network at this point whether a worm has bones, it would say, yeah, I actually think it might, um, before eventually correcting itself. And the reason that occurs in these networks is um, I'm plotting in red here the different modes popping up and their contributions to this feature. So you can see that it just turns out the first two modes make a positive contribution to that feature. And it's only when you get to the third one that it finally gets the correct value. Okay, so it's sort of this reversal over time based on the strong ordering of these modes by singular value. And it turns out in the shallow network you can show that this can never happen. So the shallow network never exhibits these illusory correlations. All right. Um, so to summarize uh, this picture, I've shown you that gradual learning in a deep network can learn interesting structure from incremental experience. I mean, one of the remarkable things about this is uh, you never see a dog, right? You only see a specific instance that your neighbor is walking next to you, right? And somehow from that, from specific instances, you abstract out the notion of a dog. Um, and this is uh, a simple model that can do some version of this from incremental experience. It's exactly solvable. And at least um, when we initially derived it, we found it quite remarkable that you get this complex dynamical phenomena, these unfolding waves of progressive differentiation, even with a completely static environment. It's just coming from the nature of the model, the fact that it's deep, and the dynamics that arise there. So I've talked about um, progressive differentiation and illusory correlations, but there's actually a lot of other phenomena that this um, model also captures. Um, and we have a paper about it, if you're curious. So with that, I think uh, I will end. Uh, I'd just like to thank my advisors. Um, a lot of this work was with Jay McClelland and Surya Ganguly. Um, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs>
Since you have such an intuition to play with these curves, I always wonder what happens, so especially like also thinking about the first half of the talk where you said like going deeper might be better in some regimes, what happens after, like on the right side of your curves actually? So if you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper or like more, 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 more parameters, does it actually plateau or is there something funky happening? Um, yeah, I'm really curious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Do you mean in the nonlinear models? Okay. Yeah. So, well. Um, so, so if you keep increasing the number of hidden units, is that what you're saying? And you're making your model more and more complex. Yeah. Does it ever start getting worse again? Yeah. I would love to know. And unfortunately, I don't know how to know yet because we don't have exact solutions for it. So all I can do is simulate really big models, and it seems to still decrease. But that's not actually. A, decisive answer. I, I think there's um, some cases where the people have analyzed support vector machines where they can show that it does basically always decrease. And I mean, there it's basically just saying regularization works, right? I mean, it, we're allowing, if you, especially if you're looking at the early stopping error, you're allowing the model to tune the regularization. So it kind of makes sense that the bigger s models are doing fine once you remember the regularization is part of the picture. So in the, in the last section where you were talking about the progressive differentiation, you talk about essentially building up this hierarchical structure, but starting with the largest class and f ending up ending with the instances. But it seems that from, from what you said actually when you were summarizing that actually it sort of goes the other way. We, we discover instances and then we learn to generalize and build bigger and bigger classes from that. So is there any way to see that occurring in a, in a network? Um. So I guess, right, so you're saying you discover, I mean, the, the, you would observe instances, but you wouldn't actually be able to represent them in their full complexity. That's what this model would claim, right? So like you would be seeing lots of dogs with all the properties they really have, but you wouldn't pick up on all those properties. You'd be focused mostly on the properties that um, group them with animals first, and then you'd split off to the finer and finer distinctions. Now, there are a lot of complications here, so you might also be thinking, wait a minute, children learn dog versus cat way before anything else, right? And that's true. There's a basic level, right, um, where they learn certain types of words very rapidly. And that's because I've com I, I would say I've completely ignored frequency effects, right? So this is imagining you were sampling your environment uniformly, whereas really I think caretakers are always saying dog, cat, dog, cat. That's one aspect of it. And then another aspect of it is you can actually come up with hierarchical structures that have stronger singular values at the intermediate levels. And that arises when there's um, strong anti-correlations. So in the models that I've looked at so far, uh, basically the cat is different from the dog, but it's not like actively the negative of the dog, right? But if that's more the case, if you know that if the dog has something, then a cat really doesn't have something, then you can get the basic level to pop out. So yeah, I mean, there are lots of um, ways in which this has to be complicated in, in real life. Is it on? Um, first, great talk, thanks for that. I was wondering if the progressive differentiation depends on back propagation or if it would work with say, the generalized Hebbian algorithm? Great question. So um, everything I've shown you is a prediction of backpropagation, and it could change massively if you use something else. So um, in terms of Hebbian learning rules, um, the if it's a contrastive Hebbian learning scheme, if you've heard of that, so you could, instead of uh, learning based on the error, you could say, I'm going to let my network settle to its prediction and do a Hebbian update, and then I'm going to let the network settle uh, and then clamp the output to the right answer and do a Hebbian update. You have to do them with uh, different signs. And that will also do sort of error-driven learning. Uh, but it will have slightly different dynamics. And, and you can, in fact, analyze that. So I haven't talked about it, but contrastive Hebbian learning converges to backpropagation in the case of weak top-down feedback, turns out, um, and then the predictions would all hold. Uh, if you have stronger top-down feedback, then it can be different, and um, it can change. I've looked at that in more detail in the context of perceptual learning, um, 
But yes, yeah, so I, I don't have a slide to show you now, but basically I think you have to go through each learning rule and test them all. The one thing I would say is um, people often ask me about second order methods. What if you use the Hessian information? Uh, the problem with second order methods is they just go to any critical point, which means they're happy to go to a saddle point. Um, and in the linear networks, if you start near, if you start with small weights, you're actually starting close to saddle points. That's what they do. So um, to analyze that, you, people basically have to add assumptions. And the assumptions that they usually add uh, bring you back to gradient descent. So in fact, I think what I'm telling you here is probably going to apply to second order methods. And then one class of model, which I think won't work, which I, some people find upsetting, but I think is, you know, is just the way it is, is simple heavy learning. So if all you're doing is correlations, then um, you don't have this error corrective signal. And um, I think there's just empirical reason to believe that that's not, in fact, what the brain is doing. So that often, if you're doing pure heavy unlearning, um, that will predict things like the most active neuron should be the one that changes the most, whereas in error-driven learning, it's the most informative neuron that should change the most. And there's experimental evidence to favor that latter interpretation. So, yeah. Right, well, if there are no more questions, let's thank Andrew one more time.